My name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the William Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Uh, delighted to have you with us. A uh, nice big crowd. It's always nice to see at a security conference a, a full room on economic issues. Uh, that uh, uh, warms the cockles of my heart. Um, so um, there are, as a moderator of panels here at CSIS, there are two kinds of panels. There are hard panels and there are easy panels. And it sort of reminds me of um, when I take my teenage boys to Funland in Rehoboth. Um, there are machines where you put in quarter after quarter after quarter and you can't win any tickets or prize, <laughs> like that claw machine. I forget that. You waste a lot of money. And there are other machines that my kids have figured out. You put in one quarter and you get lots and lots of tickets. And this is definitely one of those panels where I only need to put in one quarter and, and uh, wind these guys up and this is going to be easy. So. Um, uh, we're here to talk about U.S.-China economic relations, uh, version 2.0, uh, and this is uh, obviously an interesting time to be discussing these issues uh, because we have in, what, four days, uh, the, um, the, the, the big long-awaited third plenum of uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party's Central Committee, and uh, lots of anticipation of that. I'm sure we're going to tell you exactly what's going to happen uh, at that event. Um, uh, but seriously, we will, we will obviously touch on that, uh, hard to avoid, but I think we want to try to give this a little uh, context as well and talk about um, other aspects of U.S.-China economic relations. Uh, so we have a, a terrific panel to do this with us, um, and I'll quickly introduce them, although I think they're all well known to you and you have bio packs. Um, to my uh, far right, uh, your left, is Ambassador Stapleton Roy, a former U.S. Ambassador to China. Indonesia, Singapore, and um, a number of other places uh, that he uh, served as a Foreign Service Officer for, for many years. Uh, one of the most uh, distinguished scholars on, uh, on China that there is, and so we're just delighted to have uh, Sape with us to give us um, an overall perspective on, on uh, these issues and hopefully a little bit of a, a thought on, th thoughts on the uh, third plenum as well. Um, to my immediate right is Chris Johnson, who I think most of you know is the CSIS uh, Freeman Chair in um, uh, China studies here at CSAS, a longtime uh, analyst of China's uh, leadership in particular um, in, uh, at the CIA and uh, in, in, uh, uh, here in Washington for a long time. And he uh, joined us at CSS about a year ago and uh, I think has been uh, uh, a very uh, well-known figure to most of you here. So uh, delighted to have Chris with us. To my, uh, not to confuse things, but to my left I have the, not only the former Freeman chair in uh, <laughs> in uh, China studies here at CSIS by the gentleman who happens to be named uh, Charles Freeman. Uh, no connection, no relation. Right? At all. Um, Charles is now um, vice president at the Rock Creek uh, Global Advisors, um, where he focuses on uh, international policy issues, uh, for particular focus on Asia. Um, Charles was assistant USTR for China uh, in the Bush administration, where I had the pleasure of working with him. and uh, it's delight Terrific to have uh, Charles with us and back here at CSIS in our new, new abode. Uh, and then to my far left, your right, is Scott Miller, who is CSIS's Shoal Chair in International Business. Uh, uh, Scott, again, is, I think, well known to anybody who spends any time at CSIS, although he's only been with us for about a year, but he uh, had appeared at CSIS events before that in his long career at Procter & Gamble, where he was in charge of uh, global public policy issues and involved in uh, many of the key uh, U.S.-China uh, trade issues, uh, including uh, their accession to WTO. Uh, so uh, we have uh, about the perfect uh, panel to give a wide perspective on these issues. And uh, let me kick it off by asking State to give us some perspective, um, you know, on, on, US, on, on, on the role of economics in the U.S.-China relationship. So if you were a Martian who dropped down onto Earth, uh, depending on where you set your time machine, uh, if it was 35 years ago, you know, not much going on, maybe a few ping pong balls uh, being sold between the U.S. and China. Fifteen years ago, tremendous activity, uh, in a lot of U.S. investment in China, uh, again, uh, effort to get China into the WTO and, and uh, uh, was a focus of, of U.S.-China economic relations. In the last, you know, three to five years, you'd see um, some of that activity continuing, but a little bit more scratchiness in the, in the economic relationship with uh, some business concern about, about uh, the investment climate there, about intellectual property protection, cyber security issues, and a range of other uh, concurrency issues. Um, and so, uh, so 
I guess I, I'd like to start by asking you sort of what role economics has played in this relationship over time, how it's changed, and where you think we are today. I'll try to be brief. Uh, we're here really to talk economics, but let me provide a framework as to why economics is so important for this relationship. Uh, this is a sophisticated audience, and I think most of you are aware that the United States and China discovered common ground in the early 70s because of the Soviet threat. And when the Soviet threat uh, was vastly diminished with the unraveling of the Soviet Union, we had real difficulty reestablishing a basis for our relationship with China. Uh, partly because the image of China in the United States had been so badly impacted by the television coverage of the events around Tiananmen in 1998, uh, 89, uh, which occurred roughly in the time frame of the unraveling of the Soviet Union. So we had a double whammy. No strategic threat to bring us together and uh, strong negative reactions in the United States to developments in China. Uh, we have now recovered our footing. And we've discovered that the only way we can handle our relationship with China is by treating it as a relationship between two major powers. But the dynamics are changing. Uh, over the last 30-some years, China's economy has more than 15 times increased in size. And you have the dynamic of a rising power and an established power. Now, the relationship between the United States and China, as virtually every bilateral relationship in the world, is a mixture of cooperation and competition. And some people think the competitive factors are already beginning to dominate the bilateral relationship, and this is a disturbing trend. In fact, I think that's wrong, and I'll explain why very briefly in a moment. Uh, the, the, cause of con the cause of concern is if the competitive factors dominate the relationship, then we're going to be in the classic case of the rising power and the established power, and that leads to bad outcomes. In the case of China, I don't think it necessarily leads to conflict. We have the same problem that kept us from direct conflict with the Soviet Union. Namely, we are both nuclear powers that have the ability to retaliate against the homeland of the other side. That's an enormous deterrent to getting into direct conflict uh, between us. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, hostile rivalry will have a very negative impact on East Asia. Now, why do I disagree that the competitive factors in the relationship are the dominant? The reason, basically, is trade. Trade, bilateral trade. Multilateral trade is competitive. Bilateral trade is cooperative. Our trade with China is running over $500 billion a year. That's over 100 times higher than our bilateral trade with the Soviet Union at any point during the Cold War. So in other words, we're not looking at China as a hostile country. You trade with friendly or neutral countries. You don't trade with enemies. And our trade with China is the clearest demonstration that we do not view China as a hostile country. And our policy is designed to not have China become a hostile country. But we've had a stable military balance in the Western Pacific for basically the, the post-Cold War period. And that's been based on American superiority in naval and air power in the Western Pacific. Now China, with a large economy and growing ambitions, is developing a military which is challenging the US superiority. And that's where the dynamic that is pushing the direction uh, in, in a more troublesome competitive factor is occurring. China is developing you know, guidable ballistic missiles that threaten our aircraft carriers if they successfully test it uh, in the Western Pacific. We're responding with an air-sea battle concept that would involve taking out facilities on the China mainland. Whoops. We're talking rapid escalation to very dangerous situations if we go down that route. How do we stop it? The leaders have said we've got to create a new type of major power relationship that can bring these strategic competitive factors under control. I would argue that experience shows that both militaries are behaving normally. Each wants a balance that is favorable to its own country, and that's what the militaries are designed to do. 
So if you leave it to a, as a military problem, we can't solve this problem. We have to treat it as a problem of grand strategy. Grand strategy brings all of the components of national power into a combination design to achieve your policy goal. The policy goal is to bring strategic rivalry between China under policy control. At the moment, it's being driven by military strategy on each side. So that's where the economic component becomes so vitally important. If we don't manage the economic, the people-to-people -people exchanges, the educational aspects, in other words, the totality of the relationship is clearly not a hostile one as it was with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. We have to keep it that way and to keep the economic component, that involves trade and investment, contributing, there's going to be rivalry in those areas, but there's also going to be major co cooperation. So therefore, what we're going to be talking about today is a very important part of trying to create this new type of great power relationship that can stabilize the Chinese relationship, which will always include cooperation and competition, unless it goes wildly off the track and our policy in both countries, in my judgment, is designed to not let that happen. So you see the economic relationship in that context as being, you know, almost entirely or largely positive for, for the relationship. But there is an argument that, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. And if, you, if, you, if you're closer in an economic uh, sense, I mean, I think the people-to-people -people stuff is, is a almost, you know, un unadorned positive. But but in, in the economic realm, there is a risk of, of, of tension created that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Um, and I wonder whether you know, you've seen times when the economic relationship has actually made the, the strategic relationship more challenging over the time you've been there, and whether we may be. Let me cite two examples, Matt, because this is an important thing. I came back from four years of the Soviet Union in the early 70s, and uh, while at the National War College, visited Canada. And the briefing by our embassy up there made Canada appear like a hostile country. We had the most <laughs> egregious trade disputes. With, uh, they involved sure. fishery issues, they involved uh, t timber issues, and we were at loggerheads with them. And some of you may recall our difficulties with Japan, a close ally of the United States, and we were really bashing Japan in the early 1980s. Uh, so you can have strong trade disputes within a basically stable, cooperative relationship. That's worth bearing in mind, because we're going to have strong trade disputes with China, and we're going to have disputes in many areas affecting the economic relationship. But our goal is to create an overall relationship with China that can contain these types of difficulties and not let them push the relationship in an unmanageably hostile direction. OK, thanks. I may come back to you on, you mentioned in passing, the, the impact of a hostile relationship in this area on the rest of the region, and I want to come back to that. But let me turn to Chris um, here first to bring him into the conversation. So Chris, as a, a lot of the conversation about China, including Dave's presentation, is about trade and investment relations, and that's obviously important. As a former Treasury guy, I think of this first in sort of macroeconomic terms. And as you know, the US government has been insisting that China uh, needs to shift to a new model of, of growth <coughs> that's more domestic demand-led, consumption-led, um, rather than export and investment-led. Um, to do that is going to require them to do a bunch of very big, challenging things, like getting more people into the cities because urban consumers tend to spend more uh, than, uh, than rural uh, consumers, uh, that, uh, to, to do financial reform, uh, to, uh, you know, to end financial repression, give people a better return and, and more efficiently allocate capital, uh, to make the, the marketplace more competitive generally, which means taking on the SOEs. All these things are very difficult and have some entrenched uh, vested interests and a lot of risk associated with moving unless you do it in, a, in an appropriately sequenced way. So I guess the first question is, uh, or there's an A and a B uh, question is, do, do they see things this way? Is this just the U.S. perspective on these issues or does China really fundamentally understand that it needs to make this kind of a shift and, and why? And, and, you know, can they pull this off? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, let's start with the easier question, yeah. which is A. <laughs> 
Uh, actually, my first reaction to what you said, Matt, was uh, you, you mentioned that you know the U.S. is insisting that China do these things. Well, the Chinese leadership is also insisting that they do these things, that they rebalance their economy internally and, and, and move all in the directions that you're suggesting. Obviously, our views of what they need to do in their own are somewhat different, but the general policy direction is similar. They know they have to do these things. And I think what's been particularly intriguing on that front is to watch really even just how within the last year or two, certainly since the new leadership team has come to power, that I think you have a much broader consensus across the top leadership now than you have in years past that the current economic model is no longer functioning. And that in fact, that the gears are even grinding uh, on it. And I think that the, the big kind of so what that gave them that impression early on was the way in which the uh, policies adopted after the global financial crisis, primarily the massive stimulus program, led to almost no GDP bounce, you know, uh, or very little, not, certainly not what they would have expected. And all of them, of course, would remember well after the 1997 Asian financial crisis, where they poured in a much smaller amount of money and got a much bigger uh, return. So uh, my sense is that there's a lot of frustration with how all of this just kind of disappeared or melted away into the system, especially at the local level. Um, and that's one of the key issues that they're facing. So I think there's a pretty solid consensus across the Politburo, maybe with a few holdouts, that they need to move in this direction. Uh, the trick is how do you get from A to B and uh, by what means and how do you construct the blueprint that you're going to activate going forward. And that's what the debate now is, is, is really fundamentally circling around. Um, you know, whether or not they can do it, I think, is, is an impossible question. You know, we're just going to have to watch and see. Uh, but do they have the intent to do it, I think, is actually the more important question. And I think the answer to that one is yes, uh, for several reasons. I, I think we've seen, for example, the new leadership team has come in very strongly uh, with this strong reformist rhetoric. So you have Xi Jinping saying, empty talk harms the nation. And you have the new premier, Li Keqiang, saying, reform is like a boat against the current. It, it must move forward or it will move backward. You know, these sort of very kind of forward-leaning statements. And they might sound kind of corny to a Western audience, but they're very meaningful inside their system and convey a lot of, a lot of meaning. Uh, I also found it very interesting, and I think in part because as the new leadership team came in and settled, started to settle into place, there was some dispute with, uh, among the top leaders over exactly what they should be doing and how they should proceed. So in the absence of a consensus, they always want to function on the consensus when they can, they interestingly spent a lot of time implicitly and in some cases explicitly criticizing the previous administration, the Hu Jintao administration, for failing to do anything basically in its last 10 years. Um, that's fine, you can do that, but of course it raises expectations about what you're going to do. And I really do think that she and Lee are fundamentally aware that their credibility is on the line here. They have promised economic reform, but so far all Xi Jinping has really delivered is an anti-corruption campaign and a very deep ideological and political retrenchment. So I think they run the risk, if they don't make some steps here in the very near future, of being dismissed as retrograde, you know, if not worse, uh, not understanding the fundamental economic problems that they're facing, or at least not being able to, or willing, I think it's more an issue of will, uh, to do anything about it. So that's fundamental. Um, with that being the case, I think the new top leadership knows that they have to deliver something uh, at the plenum that we're going to see uh, open up next week. Exactly what that's going to look like, I think, is, is not going to be clear. Uh, you know, plenums tend to deliver, be high on high-sounding rhetoric and guidelines and this sort of thing, but low on specifics. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the last several rounds of these plenums in the key leadership uh, cohorts of the last couple of rounds, in 1993, obviously, they delivered a very specific plan at that plenum, but they didn't implement it until much later, uh, really, when they were trying to get into the World Trade Organization. If you look at the 2003 plenum, they did follow through pretty deliberately on some of their very vague proposals, uh, but there was so little specifics to it that they couldn't create a well-coordinated and overarching plan. So that even though they made some progress, it wasn't coordinated and therefore it wasn't very effective. So what I'm hearing is that this leadership cohort is trying to hit for the middle, if you will, and look at a, a situation where uh, they want to have fewer specifics, fewer specific proposals, but make sure, guarantee, that they can deliver uh, and implement those specific proposals. So I think things that are probably guaranteed, really, to be in the document that comes out of the plenum, uh, something on financial reform, I mean, I think it's inevitable that over the next 
two to three years, they will liberalize interest rates, they will do something with opening the capital account, they will do some kind of a partial float probably on the renminbi. These things are implicit. So if that's not there, a disaster has occurred <laughs> in, in terms of uh, the ability to achieve this consensus inside. And there you have very um, specific and competent and pro-reform oriented people running the implementation process, right? So you have Joe Xiaochuan at the People's Bank, you have Lo Jiwei as the finance minister. These are all people who are very much inclined to, to, to move in that direction, so that's a good one. The bigger questions are kind of what you discussed a moment ago, which is all these things that relate at the end of the day to getting themselves out of the debt trap that they basically got themselves into since the global financial crisis. So that obviously touches on local fiscal and tax reform. Uh, closely related to that obviously is the urbanization process and liberalizing uh, the HUCO system or the registration permit system. Uh, and also looking, I think, very seriously at land reform, uh, land use reform, and more importantly, land transactions uh, reform to allow the peasants to get more income out of the land sales and stuff like that that's going on. Those are the much harder ones. And then, of course, the big behemoth is the state-owned enterprises and what's going to happen there. What's been fascinating is that I'd say up until the last few weeks, there was a broad consensus that SOE was dead. They weren't going to do anything on that sig substantially. And in fact, Xi Jinping effectively told President Obama that during the, <laughs> during the Sunny Lands summit. Um, it's been interesting just in the last few weeks that at least in the media, there's some floaters out there. There's some trial balloons that they might do something. I think we have to be cautious, though, in that what I'm reading uh, of what they're considering, it's actually designed long-term to strengthen the SOEs, not necessarily uh, open them more to uh, private competition and so on, so we'll have to be mindful there. But in summary, I think they know what they need to do. There's a consensus they need to do it. Can they get there is the question. Well, we're certainly, um, when you talk about land reform, it reminds me of the Economist um, cover story that I'm sure everybody's seen this week. that. Um, mentions in passing that, that uh, when Deng Xiaoping rolled out his reforms in 78, the actual uh, language of the, the third plenum was, was actually pretty discouraging. Right, I mean, it talked right. about you know, supporting the commune system and mm -hmm, so forth, and mm -hmm. in fact, they, they were underneath that. They were doing some things that, yeah. that prepared for, for much more substantial reform, and so I think we're going to need you back to help read the tea leaves of what's <laughs> actually said there um, and what it, what it, how it relates to what they might actually do. Let me ask one other question before I bring the trade guys in, sure. um, which is, uh, I assume if I ask whether U.S. pressure um, on these issues has an impact on decision making that you're going to say no, <laughs> but, but in a broader sense, does, do, do, they, do they think about what the U.S. cares about when they're making any of these decisions? I mean, one senses that Xi Jinping um, in the Sunnyland Summit and, and, and um, in, in the agreement to move forward on a bit and maybe even the Shanghai FTZ, that there's some, there's some, at least an eye to what the U.S. and the international community are thinking about what they're doing, but mm -hmm. maybe that's not correct. No, I, I think obviously they take that into account. I, you know, my position is on this is they do what they do primarily for their own interests, just like any country does. But you cannot have a trade relationship like they have with the United States and not factor that into account. And in fact, I think that the, uh, especially the reform elements within the system, uh, have often seen the U.S. Uh, pressure as valuable to helping them, up to a point. Of course, you know, there's that there's that dividing line between pressure that is helpful and pressure that makes the leadership feel like they're looking weak if they, don't, if they cave. You know, there's that problem in walking that fine line. But obviously they take these things into consideration. I mean, look at, I'm sure our colleagues will discuss it in much more detail, but look at their sudden interest in TPP and you know, this sort of thing now. Uh, very interesting, of course, how they use the WTO process in the late 1990s to be able to force very difficult reforms internally that I would argue just in a domestic context they would have been unwilling to do but the WTO process gave them the external cudgel to be able to uh, engage in those reforms. Okay, so Charles, um, again, to bring in the, the trade guys. So they have said that they want to do a bilateral investment treaty uh, with the United States with a negative list approach and you know, pre-establishment um, uh, coverage, um, which is a big departure. They seem to have shifted their view on TPP. Um, they've come back to the table in the international uh, the information technology agreement negotiations. They want to join the uh, services agreement. They've done the Shanghai FTZ. There seem to be some straws in the wind that suggest that they are actually taking a more um, forward-leaning uh, view of some of these, uh, these international uh, 
uh, endeavors bilaterally with the U.S. and multilaterally and regionally. Um, do, do you think there is some kind of change of, of view going on there, um, or, or is this sort of cover for things that that uh, that maybe they're 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 not going to do as much on, and they're trying to show that they're they're more forward leaning? Yeah, I, I don't know that there's a there's it's, I don't think it's cover. I think that there are the reform elements that that Chris talked about are, are very much looking at at these external tools as means to push the economy forward. They, they need, they know that they, there is consensus at the, at the top that they do need to move to a, a, demand, a domestic demand living, uh, driven economy. They need to move to in, the, in the direction of greater productivity. So they, they, they do need to have this external pressure to drive domestic reform. But also, if they, as they look ahead and say, okay, we have, um, you, know, you know, in addition to sort of domestic consumption, GDP growth will come through productivity and innovation. That requires that they move up the value chain. And if you, you know, a lot of the, the traditional trade agreements are, are they function as bi on a bilateral basis. They look at, all right, I make something, I sell it to you. And all these new, the, the new trade arrangements are based on this very dynamic supply chain and the ability to create multiple markets within which there, there are increasingly fewer borders and fewer impediments to, to exchange of, of unfinished goods. That's been the story of the, the story of, of, of Asian trade for the last 10 years is this, the, the creation of the supply chain out of nothing and the creation of uh, the, the transfer of intermediate goods. But you know, the OECD came out with a study that, that tried to uh, last April that tried to look at uh, a new way of, of collecting trade data, which is rather than say, okay, what's the U.S. trade deficit with China? You say what because whatever what I mean, our statistics are based on current statistics are based on. Uh, the, the final transformation of a good in China, whatever that is, is sold to us, comes from China. But in fact, the OECD said, let's actually look at a uh, percentage of value add in, in tradable goods. And actually, China turned out to be the lowest mm -hmm. value add percentage mm -hmm. of any country. So what, what, I mean, it's still 60 some percent, but it's a, but it's, you know, it's a very low percentage. What China wants to do and needs to do is increase that value add as a percentage of trade through other means, and if they don't engage in these external agreements, they're going to be left behind. Mm. Um, you know, we, we don't know what's in TPP, mm. so we don't know how ambitious it's going to be. We hear rumors that that uh, you know that, that there are sensitivities that are uh, coming up from both sides, from all sides, and you know this this agreement needs to be truly ambitious. If it's not ambitious enough, then frankly, there's no point in China participating. Mm. Uh, they really need a very ambitious, liberalized. Um, uh, set of set of agreements, set of documents, TPP, uh, TISA, the ITA2, in order to have both that external pressure and that framework that drives greater internal productivity. So um, you and we uh, don't know what the FTZ is yet. <laughs> we don't know what the free trade zone in Shanghai is actually going to incorporate. We know a little bit, but we don't know fully what it is and and, um, and how far it's going to go. That's right. Um, so. Uh, Business has been, and I, I want to ask the same question to Scott, uh, but uh, let me start with you, Charles, and get your take, because you've been you know, in the trenches for a long time uh, as well. Uh, business has been a key uh, bulwark of support for this relationship for the last you know, 20 years. Um, but uh, recently, as I said at the beginning, uh, there have been maybe doubts and growing doubts in the business community about, about the um, about the return on investment in China. They're still investing, they're still making a lot of money there, but I think at the margin there is, there is increasing frustration and concern about the investment climate there, about the intellectual property environment and so forth. Um, first of all, do you agree with that? And do you think that you know, that's a problem for the overall relationship? Uh, certainly there's been, an, uh, you know, as, as Stape says, that the, you, know, you can have a lot of trade disputes in a very healthy economic relationship. And as any rela economic relationship, trade relationship matures, you're going to increase the number of trade disputes that you have. You know, I, I, looking at, at different ways the po politicals in China use to kind of stimulate domestic reform and change, um, frankly, singling out the foreigner is a pretty useful, uh, useful exercise. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, killing the chickens to scare the monkeys. And, um, you know, a good so line. You should use it. Yeah, you should use it. But the, the, the um, you know, I think as uh, you're seeing a lot of the, the individual singling out of, of foreigners really is, is designed to send a message throughout the, the larger system. 
you know, whether it's on food safety, whether it's on you know, pharmaceutical safety. And Coffee or prices, co Starbucks mm -hmm. prices. Mm -hmm. yeah. Starbucks prices, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, trial by yeah. CCTV. The, <laughs> the, I mean, there, there is that element that, uh, of mobilizing xenophobia to, to stimulate domestic change. A and I think there is some of that, and it's extremely frustrating for the business community. To the core of your, your question, though, are you, is the business community going to stand up and, and be the, the water carrier for the relationship? Um, I think there's huge frustration. Um, mm -hmm. And I, 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 so I, I think it's, you're, you're going to, if, if there's a status quo and if there isn't change, if there isn't movement forward from China to, to join these liberalizing agreements, I think you'll see kind of a, a, kind of a cooling of interest in, in from China going up to the hill and saying, no, 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 trade with China is a good thing. But um, you know, I think the chamber came out a few weeks ago with a, a interesting thing, which you know, in my time, I never thought I'd see in Washington, which is actually um, encouraging the administration to open free trade agreement talks with China, which you know would flabbergast you right. if you're working on the Hill. But that's exactly the kind of thing is that the business community wants is something really ambitious mm -hmm. that's going to drive the relationship into a new 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 level. Okay, um, Scott, uh, again, you've been in the trenches for a long time uh, from a business perspective, who's actually a company that's invested a lot in China and, mm -hmm. and has uh, been very successful in China as well. Um, again, same kind of question. Sure. What is businesses, how has businesses' um, view <coughs> changed over the years, and, and uh, do you think that that's a, a problem for the relationship, or is there an opportunity there to, to take it to a new level? Sure. Thanks. <coughs> Look, uh, one of the things in, in the last 20 years of the U.S.-China commercial relationship, one of the things you can always rely on is a disconnect between Shanghai and Washington in terms of how business looks at the relationship. And companies that are invested in China, doing business in China, have always had a different relationship than what you have policymakers thinking along here. For a long time, uh, the business community was, as you mentioned, strongly bullish on China, saw as a great opportunity for trade and investment. A uh, great new market, uh, you know, more, what, a half a billion people raised out of poverty becoming consumers is a great idea if you sell shampoo and soap. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's a lot, lot of wonderful things going on. And for many years, uh, the business community strongly defended China against the worst instincts of a suspicious Congress. I think things are different now. Importantly, there's still a disconnect between the, bu the business community as their uh, on the ground operation, uh, working on operations in China, and the policy community in Washington, but this kind of is different today. Uh, I would uh, encourage any of you to go online and look at the U.S. China Business Council's annual survey of the business environment. They run it every year. They have, uh, it's a great survey of real policymakers, about half of them based in China, about half of them in the C-suite in the United States. Uh, but they've been asking the same questions for at least 15 years. And, and they published the results, and it's, it's, it's quite revealing. This year, the, the characterization was tempered optimism. But what you really heard from business about the business environment in China is, first of all, everybody noticed the moderating growth. And when you grow 10% a year for 15 or 20 years, you cover a multitude of sins in a business plan. <laughs> it's actually pretty pretty good life, and businesses have noticed the slowdown to 7 8% on top line growth but actually you exclude some of the, you know, some of the fundingness in that, it's closer to four or five percent. And once again, this is not surprising. China is reaching the point on a per capita income basis where every other Asian tiger slowed down, including Japan. You go back and inflation adjusts the dollars. When, when, when Japan became a middle income country in the 1960s, their growth slowed from 10% a year to six, five, something like that. Same thing happened for Korea in the 70s and 80s. So this is not unusual at all. Uh, but it, but it, it, there's a subsidization that's happening in China. But in addition, businesses are facing rising costs. Everybody complains about costs now in China. Everybody complains about the intensified competition, mostly from local companies, private sector and uh, state-owned enterprises, are getting more sophisticated, are getting more competitive. It's not as easy as it was 10 years ago to do business in China. There are also, the survey reveals, a set of persistent problems. Problems that may have already been, always been there licensing difficulties, uneven enforcement, discrimination against foreign enterprises, lack of transparency. What the survey notes this year, I, I found striking, is that there's a feeling among business that it's not getting better, okay? And that not getting better is probably the problem. 
Mm. Uh, so you have this you have this sort of disgruntled realism, which is probably a better term than tempered optimism. <laughs> 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 uh, the business community. On the other hand, what, what I've noticed is the hostility or, or suspicion about China in the Congress is dialed back significantly versus where it was even five years ago. Mm. Uh, this was, you know, we spent, the business community spent a lot of time defending China against a, a really hostile attitude in Congress about uh, really sort of perceived unfairness. And <clears throat> perceived unfairness is easily reinforced when the U.S. economy has 10% unemployment and China's growing at 10% a year. Uh, now, a couple things have happened. First of all, the growth rate, the, 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 the diminution of China's growth has reduced the tension. Uh, it's, it's had a couple of effects. First, it's all reduced pressure on commodity prices, which affect U.S. business. It's reduced pressure on import competing industries in the United States. So members of Congress, with a slower growing China, actually hear fewer complaints from constituents. The other thing that's happening happened over the past decade, and uh, Ambassador Roy mentioned this as a factor, is China is a big honking export market for the United States, and it's suddenly dawning, you know, step by step, constituent meeting by constituent meeting, on members of Congress that they have real that their constituents have real export interest in China. This is a growing secure market. In the farm belt, there's no China bashing. Okay, China, half a billion Chinese improving their diet has done more for farm prices than any farm program ever enacted in the, the sight of man. So there's, there's a lot going on that's positive. Now, so what you have is a little bit of a convergence. The Congress is probably less hostile. The business community is less overjoyed, okay? And that, that creates an interesting dynamic. Uh, I, I do note also that in uh, uh, U.S. Trade Representative Mike Froman's confirmation hearing, it was unusual as a USTR confirmation hearing because the complaints from the senators we're about India, not China. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really a, a change of pace. So, so it's a, it's a moment of realism and a moment of where there's some constructive opportunities. Yeah. Whether we take them is another question. Mm -hmm. All right, look, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is 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 the big stretch goal, okay? But as Charles pointed out, nobody knows what's in it, all right? And second, uh, I, I think the most likely course of event there is that the 12 parties negotiating now, including the United States, conclude the, uh, conclude the agreement, and everybody steps back and logs on to USTR.gov and reads the text and find, uh, find out what, what do we get. Do we get chorus or something like chorus? Did we get a real 21st century agreement? We don't know. At that point, uh, decisions will be made here and with our trading partners in the Asia Pacific. And, and I think that's, that's an okay timetable. Look, China has moved a long way in, in its discourse on TPP. Two years ago, it was sort of suspicious of the thing. It moved to a point of, a, of actual hostility uh, where we had the ghost of the, of the, the Cold War. It was, it was, it was containment uh, strategy or containment being used to, as if George Kennan came back and wrote a, wrote a new chapter. <laughs> And now there's real curiosity about what's in TPP and what, how it can help. So I think that's constructive. But I think we're going to have to wait, conclude the agreement, see the text, and find out whether, where the interests lie. Um, there's lots of other indicators. In the WTO, there are key indicators. Look, in July, China basically uh, tabled a text in the Information Technology Agreement 2 that was so unsatisfactory to trading partners that they suspended the negotiations. Mm. Okay. In the same month, China and the United States at the Strategic and Economic Dialogue proposed a very impressive, deeply enhanced bilateral uh, investment agreement, which had been collecting barnacles since 2008. Okay, so make, make what you will of that. Uh, at the same time, you know, another indicator, uh, in September, China uh, petitioned the uh, current members of the, of the uh, International Agreement in Trade and Services, the TISA, Trade and trade-in services agreement, also being hosted in Geneva, uh, and then want to join. Now that's an important turnaround if it is serious, because China worked with Brazil and India and others to prevent the TISA from being a, a real WTO multilateral agreement. So it's being conducted in Geneva, but it's, uh, it's done under, under rules that, that make it not a WTO agreement. So after preventing this in 2011, now China wants to join. So there are some interesting interesting things to watch. At this point, I'll, I'll just say, watch this space. Can, can I pick up on that last set of points and, and ask you and then Charles, because he was doing this stuff, if you're a 
U.S. negotiator uh, on any of those issues, the BIT, the, um, uh, the TPP, uh, the TISA, the ITA um, renewal. Uh, do you want China in? I mean, do you <laughs> want, wh what does China bring to the table uh, and what does it burden the table with? Um, <laughs> or does it depend on, on what we're talking about, which of those agreements we're talking about? Charles would know better, but I, I, I would say it depends on the substance of the engagement, okay? Uh, an information technology agreement to the, the country beyond, beside the United States that benefited the most from ITA-1 was China, okay? And for, for China to table a, a, a lousy offer in ITA-2 was an insult to the process and, and, and was, was, was downright harmful. If China sees its interests as opening up and modernizing its services sector, which to Charles' point about, about moving up the value chain, look, embedded services are about half of world trade. When you really, if you really, really knew how to count them, okay, services are vitally important. Services markets in China are uncompetitive by global standards. And to the extent that, uh, that, a, it, that a trade and services agreement helps China in its serious move toward reforming and opening up and modernizing its services sector, I think that's a good thing as a negotiator. It's good for the world. Yeah, I, I, you, you want a motivated China at the table. Um, you don't want an obstructionist China at the table. And you don't really know what you're going to get. The Chinese are wonderful negotiators. Um, they've learned very quickly from uh, uh, that. What we do is we tend to lay all our cards on the table, and they can kind of pick the ones that they want. Um, and you know, if the, if <laughs> if uh, if they want the same things that you do, or they, they are, are aiming for an ambitious agreement, it's, it's wonderful to have, it would be wonderful to have them at any one of these agreements. And I, I really think we'll, we'll find out more next week about whether uh, the China that wants to join TISA or, or is making noise about TPP is, is a motivated China. Okay, let me, um, I want to come back to something Scott said about uh, the softening of congressional views, and you didn't talk, I don't think, about Chinese investment in the United States. As a Japan guy, uh, a lot of the things you said, you could have substituted the word Japan for China, and, and a lot of those things is what sort of was the arc of what happened with Japan. We had this right. tension when Japan was growing fast and the U.S. was in the dumps. Japan slowed down. We got better, and it sort of it died off. But there were some other things going on, like investment. Well, now that I'm, I'm onto this subject, let me ask about everybody about this, because I think it does have impact on the broader relationship. Um, so there is, uh, there are predictions. I mean, China's already starting to invest in the United States, but compared to its economy, compared to our economy, compared to other investors in the U.S., it's still relatively small, but growing fast. Um, it, uh, it raises, you know, some, some challenges in terms of uh, national security, but also politics here in the United States. But it also has these potential beneficial effect of, of giving and creating a new constituency of people employed by Chinese companies who you know, who support, uh, support the relationship. How, how do you see that safe? And, you know, Chris, if you want to comment on that too. Sure. I think the positive potential of Chinese investment in the United States is enormous. Uh, if you look at the record of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which is the body, the CFIUS, that, uh, that screens foreign investment, most of it is approved. No problem. Uh, it creates jobs. It it enables the Chinese to learn how to invest successfully by having to adjust their own management worker values in order to be able to uh, produce goods in the United States. Mm -hmm. Japan went through this process. It was extraordinarily painful. They had a 10-year process where they were just making mistakes left and right. Now I understand that 20% of our foreign investment is Japanese because they learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain areas where governments are going to be concerned about security considerations. But let's not overdo this. Every time you criticize a Chinese high-tech company because of some security problem, you are undermining the international competitiveness of a U.S. high-tech company right. that has enormous export markets. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, this is a, if Huawei can do it, so can American companies do it. So I think we ought to be a little bit careful identifying. Does it really matter whether some telephone exchange in some town in Iowa is, uh, uses Huawei equipment? Is that going to compromise our, uh, 
I had to sell my AT&T stock when I was ambassador in China so that I could promote AT&T switches for China's telecom system. And so all I'm saying is there are areas we need to be concerned, but these can easily be exaggerated for reasons that are not truly related to security concerns. And if we look overall, China's, you know, uh, I was down in South Carolina. South Carolina is welcoming Chinese investment. Mm -hmm. It's uh, producing little um, uh, refrigerators for uh, college rooms. It's uh, producing uh -huh. all okay. sorts of white goods that people want. I mean, to me, this is an enormous area. And we, from the standpoint of the Chinese investor, do not have as attractive an investment environment as many other companies, uh, countries. Uh, sorry, just to elaborate on that, you mean because of our, uh, the perception that we're, we're not friendly to Chinese environment or because of our labor costs or lack of education or infrastructure? Because or of the perception that the United States is not friendly to Chinese investment. And right. here there's an enormous difference between our states and our mm -hmm. yes. uh, federal, federal government. government. Right. At, the, at the level of states and governors, they are eager to get as much Chinese investment as they can. In Washington, people will raise concerns about wooden clothespin exports in right. terms of you know, our security. Okay, I, I, there actually was a case not involving China on wooden clothespins. Yes. I remember this from the Cold War days. Wire hangers. There was wire hangers. Wire hangers. Wire hangers. Chris wire hangers. Wire hangers. Charles and I worked on wire, wire hangers. It was broom together. handles with uh, broom NASA. handles. Yes, <laughs> which is to watch out. Can I just say one one thing about the, the investment piece because I think it's it's so important. I mean, there is the concern here that that Chinese investment is is strategic and not commercially motivated. Um, and I think that for anybody that's worked in business, strategic investment doesn't work. It right. fails. Right. Uh, if something doesn't have a commercial motivation, it will fail. So. I, 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 I don't see this stereo. Okay. Uh, since State mentioned uh, technology, uh, let me ask a sort of different but related question about, uh, to Chris about how the sort of cyber uh -huh. debate has evolved. Um, because, you know, as late as Sunny Lands, uh, <laughs> the President of the United States was still, you know, frankly being pretty aggressive, aggressive on, on the issue of, of cyber theft. Uh, particularly of trade secrets by uh, private uh, U.S. companies. Uh, in the last couple of months, some other things have uh, intervened, including the Snowden affair, and uh, and it seems like the dynamic has changed quite a bit. What what is you know sort of what's going on, and how is that going to play out in the economic relationship mm -hmm. um, on both sides? Yeah, thanks. Uh, let me just say one word real quick about the bigger the bigger investment picture. I, I actually think uh, you know if you looked back three to five years ago, the top bilateral friction point was uh, uh, currency valuation, right? Renminbi right. valuation. Now, when you talk to people, this is the issue that's emerging. And it's two way, you know, I, it, both, it's will both countries be able to invest in the other on a level playing field? You know, I think that's really the issue that's emerging as the key challenge in the bilateral economic relationship. I agree with STAPE 100%. To me, it's a huge, Opportunity. I mean, when, when I saw, for example, that the Smith deal, the ham deal, had to go through CFIA, through, I just thought that was insane. You know, <laughs> what's, what's, what's the national security implication of ham? <laughs> so it's a little hard to see that. But uh, I do think that we do look at it from different perspectives. But, uh, and, and I want to just echo also something else they said about how the other countries are, are kind of getting one up on us with regard to this. You know, where is the most dynamic? marketplace right now or, or, or sort of uh, cutting edge technology and so on for shale oil and gas exploration, it's here. And yet the Chinese are virtual non-participants despite their you know, huge desire to be able to participate. It's a tough one, you know, and, and direct ownership is always gonna be hard and so on. But what's been interesting to watch is how they're starting to learn to go in with partners or to take the minority stake and this sort of thing. And they're still getting, you know, the message I think from, from law firms and others who are helping them here with this investment is, you know, if you want technology and you want training and you want to get your guys to understand, we can get you that far. But if you want the whole ownership and decision making authority and so on, that's, that's going to continue to be problematic. But I think we've got to get this piece right. On, on the cyber piece, I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, 90% of the air has come out of the balloon, uh, certainly since uh, Sunny Lands. I do want to stress, though, that I think it's very important, that, and I think the administration's doing a good job on this, uh, to continue to try to highlight and draw what is a fair distinction between uh, economic and trade secret theft and traditional espionage. I, I do think that there's a valid distinction uh, that needs to be made there, 
And I would encourage the administration, and they are, I think, to continue uh, highlighting that issue. Our own credibility on the issue, however, has been damaged, not on that distinction, but on the kind of effort to perhaps at least be viewed as on the moral high ground uh, with regard to this. And I don't think it's because of the Snowden revelations. To me, there's nothing too terribly interesting in, in, in a lot of those. But, but uh, I think what it does do is it allows uh, people wh with whom we are having disputes over these issues to distract from the main issue, which might be this trade and, and, uh, and IPR theft toward a, yes, but what about you know, your eavesdropping and, and, and so on. So it allows them to change the conversation when they don't want to talk about it, right? And I think that's been the most damaging uh, component of, of that whole episode. The other component is just what Stape referred to earlier, which is you know, this whole issue of the damage done to our own high-tech companies. Uh, you know, there was an article in the Chinese press some months ago that talked about the so-called eight guardian warriors, um, and you know it's all of the main U.S. technology companies. And the strong thrust of the article in the Chinese press was uh, these companies' equipment needs to be eradicated from China's system. And there's plenty of evidence that there have been some industries or some ministries been some uh, directives that have gone down suggesting that that these uh, that equipment be removed either immediately, depending on the sensitivity of the industry, or over time. So I do think that's a, a, a fundamental issue as well. Uh, will it remain a fundamental challenge in the relationship? You bet, going forward. Okay, I want to open this up to the, the audience, but uh, does anybody want to comment on, on any of those issues? or? Uh, well, just one comment on the investment uh, point, which is, number one, we need the money. <laughs> I mean, you look, look at our trade deficit. Okay, second, I actually think China will have an easier time than Japan did. Yeah. because China is a fundamentally more open economy than Japan was at the time. Part A lot of the tensions, the U.S.-Japan tensions, commercially were rooted in the fact that the Japanese market was, pr for practical purposes, closed to American firms, and yet our market was open. Right. China's market is relatively open compared to Japan at the time, and I think the cross-investment will be, will be a useful thing, but I would, I would agree with uh, the comments made. I mean, just one thing. I mean, um, you know, that... that Part of the challenge for China is that it's a lot easier for the state-owned enterprises to invest here, um, but they're not the dynamic companies that, that really should be, that could be most successful here. Great. The non-state companies really are, yeah. are the ones that could be, could really benefit from, from a lot of the investment here, and they, they lack the access to credit and things Great. like that would, that would pave the way. Okay, well, a lot of other questions, but I know that you have questions as well. Um, so we have uh, microphones. Uh, please wait for the microphone and uh, identify yourself and, and do ask a question, please. There's a gentleman in the back. Hi, thank you. Uh, Jim Shudo with CNN. Uh, one phenomenon became aware of during my time in China the last couple of years was this sort of uh, use, use, use you and then move on phenomenon with American businesses there. Uh, Cisco, for instance, had great business in China until there was a local champion in Huawei, and then Cisco sees its business uh, disappear. You have that phenomenon happening now with IBM, partly driven by the Snowden revelations. It's a good excuse for Chinese companies not to buy uh, IBM services when they have this excuse. I, d I direct this to Charles Freeman, but I imagine others might have, have comment as well. Do you believe there's substance to that complaint from American businesses among their many complaints? Uh, that China will, will take advantage and, and do business and give them opportunity as long as it suits their interests and then when either they have a local champion or some other uh, you know, priority, they will push them out. Do you think that's overblown? Uh, and, and do you think that falls into the category of something that's getting worse or better as you referenced earlier? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, uh, on the Cisco issue, um, Huawei will tell you that Cisco sells more to the Chinese government still <laughs> yeah. than, than Huawei does. Um, and I, you know, I think for a lot of companies that are, have been in the capital equipment business, or other things, there's, a, there's a problem with just, there's a certain capacity that you reach and you just can't buy a whole lot more. And so companies, I think, do have to adjust their business models, adjust what they're selling in China to, to recognize that, you know, this, that the market itself is changing. Um, there, on, on the other hand, there are certainly the directives that go out fra, from NDRC or some of the other ministries that say, uh, do this and don't, don't, don't do that and do this and all the rest of it. Um, I don't know how often those are actually followed. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and if you talk to people at NDRC, there's enormous frustration that a lot of the things that they want of their own company, particularly even the SOEs, um, uh, that, that they don't actually get. Mm -hmm. that, um, 
what they want to see, the, the, what the industrial policies that they're pushing through are not successful because people are ignoring them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in answer to your question, uh, is, are there efforts at times to kind of to, to benefit local champions to the exclusion of uh, foreigners? Sure. Um, but I think the, the Chinese economy, the Chinese polity is so dynamic and diverse that I think so that it's very difficult to marshal the collective energy of the state to achieve any specific end. Anybody else want to take that on? No. Okay. Sir. Hi. Uh, Chen Weihua, China Daily. Yeah, I have a question for Ambassador Roy. Uh, you talk about a grand strategy between China and the U.S., and you think uh, we should play more emphasis on economic cooperation. But right now, I don't. I want your comment on this uh, uh, Asia pivot. I mean, wi which will have a massive relocation of American military power into that region. I don't know if I remember correctly. Like, uh, 40 more percent of the U.S. Navy is going to be there. So, do you think that's going to have a positive or negative impact? on this uh, sort of a grand strategy. Obviously, the Chinese are not very happy about this. Thank you. I prefer to refer to the policy as a rebalancing strategy rather than a pivot strategy. Uh, I think the administration is misrepresenting their own policy. As I read the policy, what it is designed to do at a time when China is rising rapidly is to demonstrate credibly to our friends and allies in East Asia that the United States intends to maintain a robust presence there and has the resources and the will to do so. We are facing global financial stringencies, and we are facing the possibility of cutbacks in our military budget. The one area of the world where a significant drawdown in the U.S. military presence would have a negative impact, negatively affecting China, is in East Asia. So we are going to be drawing down our forces elsewhere in the world, but we shouldn't be doing it in East Asia, or else China's rise becomes a threatening factor to countries around China, and they will respond, as we've already seen indicators in recent years, by trying to get big powers like the United States to put more resources into the region. So I think the rebalancing strategy is not a military buildup in East Asia. We are going to be relocating some military forces here, but in many cases they're going to be based on the west coast of the United States. Why? Because it's cheaper. <laughs> We're under financial pressures. I have talked to the, or I've heard the uh, chairman of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, what's the name, chief of the naval operations, basically say he has all the ships he needs in the Western Pacific. He doesn't need a big buildup. So I think it's wrong to present the rebalancing strategy as a big military buildup. What it's designed to do is to show that a United States that is seen widely in the world as a declining nation under fiscal pressures <coughs> in East Asia is going to remain as a strong presence there. And in my judgment, this is going to contribute to China's peaceful rise rather than detract from it. Now, I know if I were sitting in Chinese shoes, I might think twice about the logic behind my argument. But frankly, I've thought a lot about this question. And in my judgment, a proper rebalancing strategy, which I think is the goal of the administration, is going to contribute to China's own ability to continue rising without destabilizing the region. OK. Uh, sir. Uh, I'm Owen from China Energy Fund Committee. Uh, I have a question regarding TPP. Uh, how do you think, uh, what do you think of China's attitude towards Taiwan's intention to join TPP negotiation? Do you think whether China can accept the fact that maybe Taiwan is in TPP someday in the future, but China is still out? If not, do you think China will push Taiwan to join RCEP prior to TPP? Thank you. You know, I, I think even a threshold question is whether Taiwan is prepared to join TPP. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the question was asked earlier whether uh, whether the U.S. would welcome China in these other negotiations, and the answer is, yeah, motivated China, sure. Um, 
uh, on Taiwan, I have to say that the relationship between our, our respective trade officials is not good. There is a perception that Taiwan can't actually deliver its own domestic um, uh, political process to, to support an agreement. So I, I, I don't think the question is whether China is going to prevent Taiwan from joining TPP. It, you know, the United States is not going to, is, is not going to say, no, 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 we're going to let China veto this process. That's not the way it would happen. Maybe others in the TPP would, would raise, a, raise a voice. But I think the, the, a, a fundamental question is, is, is Taiwan really prepared to, do, to liberalize its own domestic system? And I think right now the answer is no. Yeah, th just two additional points. I agree with Charles. One is that any decision for a party to join TPP would be a 12-party decision at this point. It's not the United States' role to say. They would, have, they would have a voice in it, but not the only voice. Second, I would note with interest that China has just concluded a services trade agreement with Taiwan. And uh, the prospects for that and the benefits associated with that agreement will have an impact on uh, both Chinese and uh, Taiwanese uh, trade ministries and how they move forward. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Ambassador Roy. Can you identify yourself? Xiao Yang Xia, Wenghui Daily, Shanghai, China. And uh, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, that after the fall of uh, Soviet Union, U.S. China uh, had lost sort of a common ground for strategic cooperation. And uh, so, do you think that the uh, two sides could? Uh, find or re-establish sort of uh, common ground again, and uh, if so, what will it be? Will it be economics or global issues? And also, right now, the competi uh, competitive side has dominated the bilateral relations. Do you think, is it uh, still um, plausible to maintain the U.S.-China strategic stability? Thank you. I believe that we, I mentioned that we went through a difficult transition period when we had lost the previous strategic anchor for the relationship and that now we were dealing with China as two major countries dealing with each other. In my judgment and in my experience, we have discovered an enormous range of issues where we in China have common interests. Uh, we cannot deal with the North Korean nuclear problem if the United States and China did not have a common unwillingness to accept a <coughs> nuclear uh, North Korea. And we are working cooperatively there. This is a big issue. Uh, while we have different interests with respect to Iran, because China is more dependent on energy from Iran than we are, we have a common interest in not having Iran go nuclear. And in fact, there is cooperation at the United States, uh, at the United Nations between the United States and China on that type of issue. We and China are the two largest contributors to global warming. If we are unable to cooperate together, we are going to pull the rug out from under global efforts to bring the man-made component of global warming under control. And so that's an important area for China and the United States to work together. The educational sphere is an enormous area. American universities are offering branches in China. China it floods us with their uh, best and brightest students. That's an area where we can continue to cooperate and expand. Our military are beginning to restore an ability to interact with each other that has been interrupted for most of the last 20 years. Uh, this, we now have the most active and highest level of military exchanges with China that we've had since the 1980s when we got off to a fast start in that area. This is a very positive area, and I think what we'll discover as we have these types of engagements is that, in fact, there are many issues in East Asia and other parts of the world where we have common interests and are not simply competitive. So I believe that while we do have the competitive factor, and I could talk additionally <laughs> about all the areas where we have dissimilar interests, but the common interests are strong, and I think the economic component of the, of the common interest can contribute to a relationship that involves strategic competition, strategic cooperation, but is relatively stable. Yeah, sure. I, I just would add that I, I think another uh, boon to that process 
is China's growing comfort with uh, operating in multilateral spaces. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the past they did not want to do that. Now increasingly they are. Their agenda sometimes is pointed, you know, in, in those multilateral institutions, but they are becoming more comfortable there. And I think those offer other opportunities for the U.S. and China. Uh, in the region, for example, the ADMM process, you know, things like this. I think there's tremendous potential to use those as a bridge to help us with some, some of the more sensitive bilateral issues by having other people involved in the conversation. Let me, in that context, put in a plug for APEC, which is yeah. uh, a little heralded or, or appreciated, but actually, you know, it's been an area where the U.S. and China have done some useful, productive things together, and China's hosting APEC next year, and I think there's an opportunity there to, to increase that cooperation. So. Um, uh, let me take somebody in the back, uh, the lady there. Thank you, a uh, reporter from The Voice of America. Uh, we've been talking about that economic relationships have been the past most positive area in the U.S.-China relationship. But uh, recently, I've sort of seen some like hostility coming up. On the recent ABC talk show, a little boy was asked how they're going to pay China the debt, the U.S. debt, uh, debt they own to China. and. Uh, he said, how about we go into China and kill all of the Chinese here? <laughs> so I'm just wondering, so what's your comments here? Do you see it's just a little That's boy's a uh, imagination? <laughs> or <laughs> or it's, a, a, it's a certain fear in the US society about the China being the biggest investment, a bond investor in China, in the United States. Thank you. Can I jump in here? Yeah, uh, sure. I just, I just would say, I don't think you can judge the US feelings on things or character from the word of a seven-year-old or six-year-old or whatever he was, so I'd, I'd be cautious there. But you know, I do think more broadly, and this comes back to something State mentioned earlier on, this is where the people-to-people -people relationship is so important, right? right? Being able to create a familiarity with each other and a comfort level with each other that helps dispel some of these you know, rush to judgment kind of opinions that are developing in both societies. I mean, let's not, let's be honest here, there's as much of this going on in China as there is in the United States. Uh, and in some ways, perhaps in China, it's more dangerous. So. Uh, you know, I, I think this is where that people-to-people -people piece, which is often overlooked, is a, is a very, very important also stabilizer in the relationship. <coughs> okay, yes. Thank you, Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Actually, I have a follow-up question about uh, uh, the debt that the Chinese is holding. And the interdependence of U.S.-China economic relationship is regarded as uh, one of the key elements to stabilize the U.S.-China relations. But right now, the U.S. is pushing China uh, to change its economic growth model from the export-driven to the consumption-based. So do you think, uh, in the long term, uh, could be reducing the uh, incentive for the both sides to cooperate rather than conflict. Do you think the China's reducing of the reducing the holding of the uh, U.S. Treasury is a good thing for the United States? Thank you. Uh, maybe as the former Treasury guy, <laughs> I shouldn't answer this question because uh, there's a little chip planted in my brain so not to get into. Uh, these sorts of questions, but I mean, I, I don't see the inconsistency there because actually, I think um, if I mean, what the U.S. is worried about is that in an, in a post-crisis environment in which the United States has been forced to save more, uh, deleverage, you know, all levels, and where government uh, uh, borrowing is actually coming down. Uh, I mean, not you know, it's the pace is <laughs> decreasing because uh, uh, deficits are, are 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 shrinking pretty fast. Um, that uh, there is a there is a need for another source of growth than the traditional model of the U.S. sort of over consuming, over consuming, um, borrowing, and uh, and depending on uh, other countries to finance that that uh, that lifestyle. Uh, that it can't support itself. And what the U.S. is worried about is we need some other sources of growth, and, and China and Germany, by the way, is, is very much in the sights, as everyone's seen in the last two weeks, so it's not just China shouldn't take it personally. It's large countries that have persistently maintained uh, current account surpluses uh, that are in the sights of, of, of the U.S. Treasury. They, 
feel that those countries, I mean, they argue based on the economic logic that those countries need to step up and be a greater source of global demand. Otherwise, the world is going to suffer. Uh, there's going to be less of a source of demand because the U.S. can't be the consumer of last resort uh, from now on. And in, in a world, and, and that's why the U.S. keeps harping on strong, sustainable, and balanced growth, um, which is the mantra of the G20, as you know. Um, uh, and they continue to focus on balance. And the German example in the latest exchange rate report shows that this is a central concern of, of the U.S. Treasury. And in a world where there is greater balance, there should be more uh, balance in financial affairs as well, and that over time is, is um, you know, a good thing in terms of ultimately creating greater uh, global financial stability. So I think that's the way I look at, anyway, those issues, and, and as opposed to, you know, will, should China, you know, what happens if China uh, starts selling all its treasuries, which is not going to, I mean, it's not going to happen in an absolute sense. Uh, relatively, they may invest less in our uh, in, in our treasuries uh, over time, as I say, in the context of greater rebalancing overall, that's not inappropriate. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Jeannie Nguyen uh, with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. My question is to Ambassador Roy, but to the whole panel. Come back to the grand strategy, which is something we hope that will sustain the peace and growth of the region. Um, I think the pivot to Asia first was to focus on Southeast Asia. And the market there with 600 million people and developing country where all the potential buying, consuming would be. So with the TPP, China is not there yet. Now the question was between exporting and importing economy in China, and you just answer that to balance the global market. Where do you see Vietnam fits in? Because Vietnam geopolitically is between China and the rest of the region and the US, and Vietnam is a member of the TPP. Vietnam also share the governing system with China, the ideology what? with China, with the SOE situations and all the problems with China. And Vietnam also is being, oh, most of the market in Vietnam, we in significant trade deficit with China. On the paper and off the paper, there's tremendous um, products from China that went into Vietnam through the borders without any rec recordings at all. So I understand that there is a problem with the rules of ori origins with Vietnam entering the TPP, and China is ready to take advantage of that. So where do you see the potential uh, Chinese taking advantage of this TPP market through Vietnam? I learned from many speakers, especially Ms. Bonnie Glasser, that China is very good at taking opportunity, opportunistic um, in many different fronts. And what lesson have we learned in dealing with China, or embracing China in the WTO throughout the last decade okay. with their manipulations in many different okay. fronts? Th that's a very complicated question with a lot of different <laughs> strands. But let me, uh, Vietnam was one of the few Southeast Asia countries where you were not ambassador uh, state, <laughs> but, uh, but perhaps can you, uh, can you comment on the sort of the bigger s question about Vietnam and China? Uh, and then maybe these guys can help with the trade. L let me briefly comment on the first part of your uh, uh, question. Uh, I think an important component of the rebalancing strategy is to be paying attention to Southeast Asia. Um, I think, objectively speaking, earlier, we were never neglecting China, we were never neglecting the North Korean nuclear problem. But beginning with the development of new architecture in East Asia following the Asian financial crisis in 1997, frankly, the US government was not paying attention. For example, in the Bush administration, which I thought did very well on the China side, they never made up their minds whether they wanted the United States to join the East Asia Summit. Uh, 
how we could not have a view when all of the top leaders of Asia were meeting together and we didn't think you know, whether we should be there. So President Obama, who of course spent part of his childhood in Southeast Asia, understands the important significance of the area. You referred to the fact that it's a market of 600 billion people, uh, uh, a million people. It's a, it's a very significant area of the world. And I think that the US strategy now in East Asia is much more balanced between the northern parts and the southern parts. But the TPP parts of this question, I will turn over to my colleagues. Yeah. You guys just, just um, I guess to the extent your question is, uh, is can China take advantage of Vietnam's participation in TPP? Uh, I'll, I'll say one thing. One of the, the, the current kind of topics about uh, sort of the political impediments here to TPP is over the question of footwear imports. Right. Um, and, and because, in part, because we have, there's, there's production of certain footwear up in Maine that, that, is, that, is, that folks are concerned that if, if there's, there's a free trade agreement that greater imports from, from Vietnam or footwear will disturb that production. But that production actually is essentially imports of components from China for reassembly here. So the, the issue for me is, you know, if, if China's already taking advantage of the fact that Viet Vietnam is not in TPP, <laughs> to the extent that we think of it those terms. So I, I, I think there are plenty of, of opportunities that Vietnam has, as long as, you know, they um, can convince our negotiators to uh, use appropriate judgment with respect to rules of origin and things like that. Okay, I'm being given the high sign in the back. I'm, I'm afraid you'll have to do your follow-up question uh, uh, up here. Um, but let me uh, thank our panelists for joining us for a very interesting discussion. I learned a lot and hope you did as well. Please give, me, uh, give them a round of applause. And uh, I think I haven't been instructed what to tell you, but I think there's a short break and then the next session starts at uh, 11, I believe. 11.15. 11.15. 11.15.